Welcome and we're live. And we are live. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Special edition, special Friday edition mm. of the Sauzcast. I'm your host, Adam Sauzdick. Welcome to the Sauzcast. Typically, all we talk is money. All we talk is money. But today, we're talking dating. We're talking relationships. We're also talking how men can become the best versions of themselves. Did I say that right? Too? We can talk about oh, money. We're going to talk money, baby. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> but if you're a man out there, specifically if you're a young man under, under 40, okay? I'm 41 now. I'm no longer in that category. You're you're, how now. old are you? I'm 31. 31. Yeah. Man, you're looking good. If you're a young man out there, you do not want to miss this episode. This episode is dedica dedicated to helping young men become the best versions of themselves. I We're going to focus it. on that. We're going to hopefully help you get wealthier, smarter, better, like just improve every aspect of your life. And we got Hafiz Bauku. Oh, look at you, Did man. I do it? <laughs> you got it. The host of The Roommates yes, yes. Uh, in the house. Thank you so Welcome much, Welcome to the Sauzcast. Adam, listen, man. Before you do your introduction, man, I... I'm a big Adam fan. Really? I'm a big Adam fan. When I met you for the first time, it was last year. You didn't know that. We didn't get to talk much. No, it was in and out Yeah, quick. but I, I love, what I love the most about you is how you are authentically yourself. And during the initial, you know, episodes of the PBD podcast, mm -hmm. you came in every single day defending your points all the time in hostile territory at times. Oh, yeah, it was rough at times. It was rough at times. <laughs> but I love that. I love yeah. the energy. I, I just love it. So I, honestly, man, when they told me, Adam wants you to come on the podcast, I was supposed to leave last night. Yeah, I heard. I said, you know what? For Adam, I'm going to be here. Thank you, bro. Respect. Well, uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate you being on. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. Where the ladies at, man? I, Where the, you guys, exactly. You guys fire them? What's I going know. on? <laughs> ladies had the day off, apparently. We, we, it, had we known that you'd be on, I, well, because you did an interview with PBD yeah, yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And I had lunch with Pat. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Sam, who works with Pat, his assistant, um, comp troll over here, respect to Sam, was saying Hafiz is coming in from the roommates. He's going to do a thing with you. I said, yo, Sam, why don't you let me know he was going to be here? Yeah. We could have coordinated. We could have done something. And then, so we kind of pulled this off last okay, minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the way I looked at it is like something's better than nothing. Of Next course, time we maybe we course. bring the ladies in, and have course, a little, uh, have a little banter. David's here. Thank you, David, for what being up, here, David? making Absolutely. time for us. You're, you're you know how important you are these days. So you know, <laughs> I'm a decent alternative. You're, you're, you know, so uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, respect to you. We'll make it work. Hey, but, <laughs> each man his own. Uh, I I really want to get to know you yeah. and what you stand for. But most importantly, I really want to deliver some value and a little bit of that attainment that I love of to talk about for our audience out there. Um, you know, my background is I, speaking of like helping men become better, I was always very athletic. Mm -hmm. I was always pretty much good at whatever I did. I was a, a, a sports guy. I was good in school. I, you know, did all right with the ladies. Yeah, I was yeah. always popular. I was always pretty good, but I didn't come because I was a comedian. I, I was a, I did a little of everything. I was a jack of all trades, but I didn't become great at something until I got into the financial world. And mm -hmm. I've been doing that for 15 years for basically a hedge fund. Um, and I became great at one thing. So I always tell people you need to be a specialist. You need to specialize in something. And you are a specalist in helping men become better. Yeah. Right. So how did that, yeah. I want to get to know you. We'll <laughs> yeah, get into yeah, that. Yeah, how yeah. did that become your niche? Yeah, no, it's good because first things first is I hate niches. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely hate niches because I feel like it pigeonholes you, especially, um, we won't get too, um, political here, but especially when people identify you as a black person in America, hmm. they niche you into, if you're going to be intellectual, you usually talk about race. So when you think about some of the top black intellectuals, one of the most prominent things they talk about is race. When they bring them on to talk about like deeper issues, usually it's race, right? You have a guy like Neil deGrasse Tyson talks yeah. about science. There's an exception to the rule. Most intellectuals, most conversations are geared towards race. So I hated the idea of being pigeonholed to one thing. But... Um, I'm comfortable <laughs> being the individual who's helping uh, men become the best version of themselves because that's just that's just my life. Mm -hmm. To answer your question, 19 years old, um, I played college football at Troy University. Um, I was really passionate about football. I wanted to make it to NFL like every single <laughs> other 18-year-old right. kid in the world, 18, 19-year-old kid. And then I became a Christian, 19 years old. And that changed my whole worldview. Instead of me looking at life like, what can I get? I looked at life like, what can I give? And also, I just stopped caring about football. 
Like I just stopped. while you were playing, you're while I was playing, man. Yeah. Wow, like it was. You understand? Like my coaches, my players. I, I even reti- I retired at like 20 years old. Like it. Like I hang just, the jersey up, ha- ladies and gentlemen. The, I'm done. Yeah, 20. I'm done. I just I just stopped caring about. It. And what was more interesting to me is like mm-hmm. helping my teammates. Because, you know, though they were the alpha males, though they were the, you know, the head dogs on campus, though they were everything, you could see them, like, they were the greatest, like, representations to what a man is and the life you should live as a college mm-hmm. athlete. You're basically right, king. there's nothing bigger in college than being the college football player, the BMOC, the big man yeah, on campus. Yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but the reality is, man, they had a lot of demons, you know, and people... They had no one to talk to because mm-hmm. who do you talk to? And for some reason, they just like talking to me. I had had a, a teammate who later on played in the NFL for a couple of years, and he would take me. He, we both went from we were both from the same hometown, and he, on our ways to school there after spring break, we would just sit down. And we would talk for hours, and they would always pour their lives out to me. So I was I was more interested in that. And so after retiring, I call it retiring. Yeah. I just spent most of my time doing that. After graduating college. Um, I said, you know what, I want to, to be a pastor. And that was my heart desire. So you studied or you wanted to I be a pastor? I wanted to. So I, okay. went to, I, I, got, I um, applied to Southeastern Theological Baptist Sem- Seminary, got accepted into that. Um, and then I got fired from working at a church. <laughs> so, How did that happen? Um, I was young and I was, a, I was very passionate and I was going through a lot. So I wasn't like I was sleeping with the pastor's daughter. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing crazy. Juicy nothing juicy and Damn, juicy. man. <laughs> I, nothing, Hafiz, I wanted that kind of story. I, I know, we, that would have okay. been great, but it was just <laughs> like I, I, was, I, was, I was like not a good person to be around at that time. I was just mad all the time. Hmm. Um, and I was frustrated because I felt like I was underused. I felt like I wasn't being valued. And there was a lot of other things that went on. Got ended up getting fired. I needed to pay bills, so I became a teacher. So, I, so people don't know this about me, but I was a preschool teacher. Wow. I taught second grade for, yeah. for a year and a half, so yeah. I feel you yeah, on that. Yeah. How so was, was that, being a teacher? I loved it. Preschool yeah. was one of, besides working at McDonald's, preschool was my favorite job ever. Besides working at McDonald's? Yes. Okay, so why, what did you love about preschool and what did you love about Let's McDonald's? Let's go McDonald's. People, so what I tell people all the time is like the greatest thing about doing anything in life it's the people that you can just do that thing with mm-hmm. like that's the best thing like college sports the teammates right the camaraderie school, the camaraderie all my best like half of my best friends in high school worked at mcdonald's with me <laughs> <laughs> this was in atlanta or yeah, was in atlanta okay, i was gotcha. in atlanta yeah so they all we all worked at the same mcdonald's and then you had all the girls would come into mcdonald's it was, so baby it, you want some know, free fries yeah, like yeah. One milkshake yeah, it was so much fun like it was it was so much fun because the environment the energy the bosses were super cool so i love working at mcdonald's you get free food i loved it it was to me i had a time of my life working at mcdonald's minimum wage though i said yeah, of course but you're 15 16 years what do you old care? Who, you you're making some money, money. you're yeah, getting yeah, some free yeah. french fries and you're looking good for the ladies yeah, not looking good but you're you're able to talk to the ladies they, exactly. you know, they, they have to stay and listen to you talk they have to they have to <laughs> You, know what I mean? you ain't going nowhere you ain't until going your order's nowhere. ready. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Yeah, uh, preschool, what I love about preschool the most is that every single day, the mm-hmm. students came to school with the brightest smile. So no matter what happened the day before, they always reset the next day. And I love that about those mm-hmm. kids because when you get older, you get mad at, let's say you get mad at your boy David. David, right? Yeah. You get mad at your boy David. Every day. He comes the next day. You still mad at him? You know what I mean? No, 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 no. not until I have my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll tell you about you that. know, but the but the beauty about those kids is you you have the roughest day with them. Mm-hmm. The next day, t- it's like ten years ago for them. Yeah. So I love that positivity. I love that kindness. So, long story short, I became a teacher, moved to Dallas, started teaching um, middle school. I intensely taught seventh grade. They said the worst grade to teach in seventh grade. I wow. wanted to teach seventh grade. Um, I also wanted to teach at an all-black school, the worst, one of the worst performing schools in the district. I wanted that school because I wanted to give those kids an opportunity they would never have. And I wanted to be with young men during the most developmental um, um, stages, which was that 13-year-old. So mm-hmm. I was a teacher for two years. After doing it for two years, I realized it was not sustainable. What I wanted to do, I needed more resources. I couldn't create the change that I wanted to create as a teacher. Bread tape, bureaucracy, all that nonsense. My hands were tied. So I said, I need to make money. 
So initially, I wanted to become a filmmaker. So I spent a whole uh, summer making a bunch of short films to get into USC film school. But then life happened and a bunch of other things happened. And I decided to um, go back to education. But instead of being a teacher, I was working as a videographer for a charter school in Houston. And that's where I started the podcast in 2017. Gotcha. And that's so what, what age were you the teacher? And what, day, what age were you when you're like, all right, this isn't working for me? I started teaching when I was 22 years old. And I stopped, I believe, when I was 26. Dude, we have the we have a very similar path. I played college football. Yeah, yeah. I was, you know, sort of a jack of all trades. Yeah. I was in the nightlife in Miami, comedy. I was I, I worked for a sports agency for a little bit, but the last job I had, it's ironic um, how it motivates you to figure out how to make some money. Yeah, was yeah. when I was twenty six. I was a teacher. Yeah, I was a substitute teacher. The the I was just kind of doing a bunch of different classes. The main teacher got sick. They're like, would you like to teach this second grade class? Next thing you know, I'm the teacher for the whole year. Oh, wow. Loved it. Amazing. Just like I've always like I was a camp counselor. I've always gotten along with yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with kids, especially young guys and you know, like an older brother, uncle yeah. type. Uh, but it's funny how being in school and dealing with that will motivate you to be like, all right, I got to make some money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, that yeah, was yeah. my last job before I got into the financial world That's to awesome. make some money. So. Um, so go from there. You, yeah. you, you got into videography yeah. and that led to the podcast. Yeah, so, so basically, a long story short, I, I moved to Houston and I always wanted to start a podcast. I was doing a bunch of other stuff before. I'm just giving you the bird's eye perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I always wanted to start a podcast. So when I moved to Houston, I moved in with moved into a house um, with four other guys. I literally met a month beforehand. And I moved into the house, and we would always have these late night conversations talking about all types of things. And I was like, "Bro, why don't we start a podcast?" They didn't know what a podcast was. I was a big podcast guy. Yeah. I was a big Joe Rogan guy. I was a big Brilliant Idiots guy. So I was a big a po big podcast guy. And then eventually, I found a studio. I found somebody to record it. And then me and my roommates started a podcast called The Room. Hence the Room. <laughs> oh, great name, by the way. Yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate Got it. it. And you've been doing this full time for how long? I've been doing it full time since 2019. So do, doing it full time for the past what? Two and a half, three years. Yeah, three, 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 three years and been doing it for five years. So yeah. how has your mindset evolved? Yeah. Because again, we're talking about men getting better. Yeah. Men becoming the best versions of themselves. Yeah. Walk us through your mindset of when you were, you know, that 18 to 20 year old kid, you retired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that you were, you know, helping guys kind of get better. Yeah. Teacher, um, videographer, yeah. roommate, podcast now, yeah. you know. Now, that's Debonair, good. looking fresh, <laughs> yeah, 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 three piece. Yeah. Walk us through your mindset and what's changed or what's evolved. So I'm going to be 100% honest. It's going to sound very arrogant. I was I was almost the same person at 19 than I was today. Hmm. Almost the same person. Really? Reason why I was so mad is because I had all these ideas, but nobody would listen to me. <laughs> why? Because you had no credibility. I, yeah, I you had no platform. I was a kid. Yeah. At my church, my the, all the pastors there were superstars. They were like these superstar speakers. They're the most sought after guys in America. Like they were like the young stars. Hmm. So I I was the youngest of all of them. Like the, the second oldest guy from me was like 24. They were all super young, but I was the youngest of all of them. But I was just like their redhead stepbrother. Why is that? They were, I was just, in, like they all came from Texas and they moved to Atlanta. So they were already established. So, you know, they were, they were well known in the, in, the, in, the, in the church community. So I just came as this 19 year old kid with just a bunch of ideas and a lot of passion. Um, and they dismiss it because they because of your age, or did they dismiss it because of the ideas, or or is it a combination it a of combination, all of it? It was a combination of all that. It's just it's just like I was the young brother to them mm -hmm. who just needed to wait his time, and I didn't. I thought my time was then. When I was 20, when I was nineteen, twenty years old, I thought my time was then. Got it. Let, 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 let's stay there for a second yeah. because it's interesting because yeah. my mindset has completely changed yeah, yeah, yeah. since when I was nineteen. Yeah. But you're basically saying, no, 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 dude. Yeah. Like, I'm the same exact person I was when I was 19. Yeah. It's just that now people are listening to me. 100%. Now I have a little bit more credibility. Yes. Now I look a little bit sharper. Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah, in my yeah. McDonald's outfit anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what do young people need to know if maybe they're that 16, 18, 20, 25-year-old kid and people are like, ah, get out of here, kid. Yeah. You're a Gen Z. Wait your turn. Yeah. Wait, I, get out of here, little millennial guy. Whatever. Yeah. You know, we, we still got this. What's your advice for young people who are being dismissed? Nah, I think to me the, the dopest part about today is the internet. Even though the internet was a thing back then, um, it was younger and it cost a lot more to make content. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I my first YouTube video came out in 2012. I had to pay $1,500 of my own money to shoot that YouTube series called the, the Real Talk series. 
So it wasn't a sustainable model back then. And back then I was like, I want to shoot from, I, I shot videos out of my webcam, but I was like, yo, that's crappy. No one's going to watch webcam videos. Now people are watching videos from, the, from their cameras. Mm -hmm. So the dope part about today, if you're a young guy with a message, is that you have an ability with the social media era, with social media and all types of things like that, to be able to promote and share your message. But I also want to add that though I was, had a lot of great ideas, I didn't have, I didn't live life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I haven't, like, I didn't live life. You had ideas, you didn't have experience. 100%. And so to me now, like, I got a, I got a, I got a text the other day from one of my students. He's 23 years old right now. I recently got married. I met him when he was He's 15. 23 yeah. and got married. Yeah. Met him when he was 15 years old. Look at you guys. <laughs> yeah. We both were like. <laughs> <laughs> he 15. And did you encourage him to get married? Or I didn't, just... but I would have. You would have. 100%. Now, by the way, are you married? Yeah, I got married. You're married? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At yeah. what age? Uh, I got married last December. Okay, so at 30? Yeah, 31. 31. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, was... we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get to relationships. <laughs> Hang tight, yeah. guys. Yeah, I got a message from him. Um, he was like, Coach Fees, I love, uh, thank you so much, man. I, I saw you from a recent viral video on Fresh and Fit. <laughs> and he was like, and I, and I haven't seen you from years, but the messages you taught me then are still the messages I'm applying to my life. Hmm. Then I had another kid. He came on the podcast recently. I met him when he was 12 years old. He's one of my students. Now he's 20 years old. He came on the podcast and we were talking. He was like, yo, the same stuff I'm seeing you talk to the guys on the internet, the same things you were telling me when I was 12 years old. So to me is that, the advice I give mm -hmm. is not just theory. People have lived this. You know what I mean? And so that's where in my space where when people want to help, yes, you might have good information because I was a parrot. The reason I'm good is because I can emulate people very well. That's one of my superpowers. I can emulate people. And so I could be able to watch a, a Patrick Bet David, a Jordan Peterson, a Mark Driscoll, a Gary Vee, and I can be able to do and say exactly what they communicate and say. So I have a good message, but that's not my message. Mm -hmm. It wasn't refined. I don't have the way of actually seeing people's lives transformed by what I said. And so going back to the young person, bro, you're 19 years old. You want to be a motivational speaker. Who have you motivated? Who, whose life had you transformed? But not just that. It's not just about motivating someone in a year. Who have you seen the past 10 years? They've applied your, your advice and they've gotten better. Because mm -hmm. you can give somebody advice at 17 years old. They do it for six months. They get good results. But then 21, their life's a wreck. Yeah. So are you 100% sure the mess that you're teaching actually works? And the reality is it needs to work on you. Yeah. Well, I believe in the business world, they call this proof of concept. 100%. Right? So, all right, walk us through what you're saying to yeah. these guys. Like, are there certain cornerstones or principles that are part of your coaching program? You called yourself Coach Fee, so I assume a lot of these nah, young guys... No, I was a football coach. Got, okay, gotcha, yeah, yeah, gotcha. I was a football gotcha. coach. That's why you call me Coach Fee. Gotcha, yeah, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. But are there certain, you know, principles that you stand for? So, for instance, you know, I'll give you a, a little uh, glimpse into what I talk about. So, I started off in the nightlife world, um, South Beach. I grew up there, you know. Um, and then I question, yeah, Miami, Phoenix, you party for a night. I mean, Miami, however, I did have a good time in Scottsdale and that, like that little circular, whatever area it's yeah, fun, yeah. but it's not close, bro. Um, the beaches, the land, you know, it's, but I, I will super impressed in Phoenix. Why do you bring up Phoenix by the way? Phoenix, I, when people, most people don't know, in my opinion, yeah. Phoenix is America's unkept Sorry, sorry, best kept secret. I actually agree with you. Yes. I left because Scottsdale's just yes. outside uh -huh. of Phoenix. There's this Saints. area there. Yeah. I remember leaving and I was there for 48 hours for a wedding. And I remember telling my cousin who I was there with, I was like, dude, this city's like low key dope. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The women, the like yes. the, the I, I will say this might ruffle some feathers. You might go up to this is the problem that I have. I like American women. Okay. Like I I was married for a for a time to a British woman. I've dated Colombians and Cubans and yeah, Brazil. Yeah. I've done it all. Yeah. But there's nothing more than <laughs> Excuse me. I, I'm just saying. <laughs> 41 years old. I've had some time. I've had some experience. Yeah, I've yeah, uh, yeah. I've done some proof of concept. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. But there's nothing I like more than banter. Like yeah. what we're doing right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like if you were a girl, that. super into you. <laughs> <laughs> super into you. But the problem that I have in Miami, and we'll get back to the money side and the and principal side that I stand for. Um, the problem that I have is maybe I'll see someone nice lady at the bar club whatever no speaking you know. no English yeah and I'll say hey how you doing they're like oh yes hello how you doing and I'm just like I can't work with that I can work with that you. for a short period of time of course not extended period of time uh -huh. so I like banter so, but every girl I spoke to in Phoenix 
Hey, yeah, what's up? Yeah. No matter how they look, black, yeah. white, brown, yellow, green, whatever. They were just like, hey, what's up? And down to have a good time. Yes. So I'm telling you. It's so something. I'm biased. Miami. I live here in South Beach. Yeah. But to me, Miami reminds me of beachfront property in L.A. Mm -hmm. It's obviously beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's obviously valuable. But for that price, though, <laughs> value, value, you know value. I mean? Come on, exactly. And so, what I love about Phoenix is it was like, how can I say this? It's kind of like Austin, Dallas properties mm -hmm. before the bubble. Okay, that's cool. Where it's that's like, cool. yo, you can yeah. get a whole estate for like six hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. You know what I mean? So, Phoenix, I I was shocked because most people when they think about partying. Yeah, New York, L.A., Miami, and if you black, Atlanta. Yeah, right. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been out in Atlanta yeah, too. Yeah, Don't yeah, discriminate yeah. now. No. Yeah, it's it's usually these four places. Yeah, but most no one will ever think of Phoenix, Arizona. Like you will have a, an yeah. amazing time. It's ironic you bring this up and you're like because we recently that you don't live there. You said you live in Dallas. When, from I Atlanta. have this thing. I went to Phoenix once in my life when I when I was single. Yeah. <laughs> and I honey, I, honey, <laughs> it was not recent. Yeah, I had the time of my life. Yeah. I have never, I was shocked by how beautiful the women were in Phoenix. Yeah, I agree. I was shocked. Because like yeah. you said, I, did, I didn't know about it. But then people tell me about Arizona State yep. and Arizona, how they're known for their beautiful women. Yeah. And I was also shocked by how beautiful yet down to earth the women were. Totally agree. You see? what every and, I, and, and so I make it a thing. Whenever yeah. I meet a guy from Phoenix, I ask him yeah. to confirm my theories. And yes. it has never failed. I agree with you. Dave, I was there you to Phoenix? I haven't, but I have to go now. You have, David. David, you're going to Phoenix now. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I will say you brought up Austin. I thought Austin was fine, a little dirty, a little scuzzy, a little homeless-y. Uh, no, I you know, there's Austin. a game that you play in Austin. Shout out to our friend Nancy. She said, when you get there to Austin, you got to play the game homeless or hipster. <laughs> and I'm playing that game. I was wrong <laughs> half the time. But uh, I did like Phoenix. I yeah. did like, um, I, I enjoyed it there. And the weather's actually pretty dope as well. Yeah. Um, but real talk. I mean, Miami for 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 the price. I get it, Phoenix. Yeah. But back to my question to you about values. what values, principles, yes. what what things that you know you pinpoint. So when I got out of the nightlife business and I taught for a little while and I got into the money world and I started to make money and next thing you know, I'm working with all the top financial advisors and insurance advisors and estate planners. That's how I met Pat yeah. at a conference and eventually I started my own show to basically teach millennials and now Gen Z, young men, young people, how money works. Mm -hmm. I developed what I call the six principles of wealth, six cornerstones of building wealth, mm -hmm. right? Uh, number one is having a game plan for your money. Number two, don't lose, which is debt. Number three, save that money, which is my motto and understanding like a saver's mentality versus a spender's mentality. Once you can master those three and get a hold of your budget, and stop living paycheck to paycheck and focusing on net worth. You can become an investor and in what investing looks like and whether that's real estate, stock market, uh, crypto, NFT, whatever you want to go with it. Um, and then protecting it all, protecting your biggest asset, which is you, not your assets. You're, you are your biggest asset. And then if you can do all that, you can be what is known as chilling. Chilling is what I call the new retirement. Like when you retired, when you're pre-retirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right now I'm in the chilling phase of life. Yeah. So the I... Everything I do kind of fits into these things. I'm chilling. This is not how I make my money. Yeah. I made my money in the financial world, right? Um, but now when you're chilling, you own your time. You do yeah. what you want with your time. So these are things, these are cornerstones. These are principles that I teach people. So do you have certain cornerstones or principles that when you're coaching or talking to people yeah. or helping men become, what are your principles or cornerstones that you advocate? No, that's great. And I think I think the first one, I have many Things I've been I've been working through. I have my ten steps to healthy manhood. Have different masculinity traits than believe men have to tap into. I'm working on this new thing called a, the greatest story ever told, which is just basically about this idea where when you understand the eleven themes of every great hero story hmm. and how it applies to your life, it changes everything. You're better able to live your life with the most passionate, purposeful um, vigor that you've ever experienced. But I think the the, the number one fundamental thing is radical accountability. I was recently reading an article um, from Jocko Willink's book called Extreme Ownership. Mm -hmm. And he talks about one of the key things about being a, a, a Navy SEAL is you have to have radical accountability. Mm. And radical accountability to me is that quarterback's mindset. What positions do you play? 
I was a receiver. You're a receiver, so you don't understand this. But <laughs> <laughs> you don't oh, understand this oh. because I said, were you a quarterback? I or was you? a cornerback. A corner. Yeah. We'll burn yeah. You, bro. <laughs> we'll burn you. <laughs> a quarterback's mindset is when we lose, it's all my fault. It's on me. Yeah. Taking ownership. This is what you call yes. like radical accountability. Radical, yeah. A receiver, respectfully, if you lose, you didn't give me the ball. Right. <laughs> you know, but a quarterback. The old T.O. thing. Yeah. Like, give me the damn ball. Yeah. The Randy Moss thing. Yeah. Give me the damn yeah. ball. Exactly. And, and there's nothing's wrong with that. It makes sense. But a quarterback has a mentality. Totally A different. great leader has a mentality. Mm -hmm. Imagine LeBron James losing the game. He's like, yo, you know, I gave him my all, but Anthony Davis missed that last shot. Yeah. As a leader, it is all your fault. So as a man, you have to realize you are where you are because mm -hmm. of the decisions you've made. And you're going to be where you're going to be because of the decisions that you will make. So when you have the understanding, you lose the victim mentality. Mm -hmm. So I, I give the example of like, let's say there's a mountain. And on top of this mountain is this beautiful cherry blossom tree. And the word on the block is that if you can eat this cherry blossom, a cherry blossom from this tree, whatever you want out of life, whether it's some models, whether it's some nice cars, whatever you want, get, climb this mountain, get the cherry, you got, you got what you it's want. It's yours. It's yours. Here's the deal. Some people climb the mountain with a rocket ship. Some people climb the mountain with a Jeep Wrangler. Some people climb the mountain with their two legs. Mm -hmm. Some people climb the mountain with one leg. Mm -hmm. Some people climb the mountain with no legs. Some people have to climb the mountain on a wheelchair. Yeah. Everyone has to climb the mountain, yeah. but you have different tools to what you have. Right. So that's life. That is life. Fact. There is a mountain that every man has to climb. There is, and every man has different skills to climb the mountain. Some have easier skills than others. It doesn't matter what you have. You still have to do the job at hand. Mm -hmm. And so when you have the understanding, that perspective, now it's up to you to now begin that journey. So that radical accountability is something that's extremely important because a lot of men are upset because they're not where they're supposed to be because of X, Y, Z. My dad never told me he loved me. My mom wasn't there for me. This girl broke up with me. That job fired me. My coach didn't believe in me. Everybody has a story. Some stories are better than others. It's, it's true. Yeah, some, some people have horrible victim stories, and I've heard them. But at the end of the day, you still have to climb the mountain. Mm -hmm. And so when you have that radical accountability and you understand that now you have the decision to make, to what, what are you going to do? Are you going to be on team bitter and sit down and complain and whine about the problems of the world today? Or are you going to be on team better? Improve your life, get all the tools necessary, and use all your skills to your best of your ability to succeed. So radical accountability is one thing. And then the second thing, which is what I'm most passionate about today, is like-minded community. So um, I'm wearing a suit from my new suit line called the Standard. So the idea of the Standard is that some men meet the Standard and some men are the Standard. Hmm. Financially, Adam is the standard. When people want think about making money and being successful financially, they want to be where Adam is at 41. But there's other 40 guy, 41 year old guys who just met the standard. They probably earn sixty two thousand dollars a year, the typical salary I'm guesstimating here for mm -hmm. a 41 year old man. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you ask most people, would you want to be Adam or would you want to be average Andy? They would want to be Adam. So it's, it's, so basically the, the company is for those guys who want to be the standard. But, but more than just clothes, it's a community of excellence. Because the idea is that imagine it's like Dallas Country Club and to get in you have to buy a suit. So it's a limited edition collection. Only a limited amount of guys can buy a suit. But when they buy it, they get access into this community. And so my desire is that by having like minded men you're able to work together to achieve extraordinary results so example i gave is that adam went through his process for 41 years and this is where he was today so mm -hmm. let's say adam was 30 years old he went through this for 11 years to get to where he is today he, 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 he learned this made this mistake learned this made this mistake and he did that for 11 years but imagine there was 10 of you Guys just like you, as hungry about money, as hungry about comedy, as hungry about all the things that you value. Mm -hmm. And you guys, every single day, you went out and lived your life. 
you went out, you lived your life, you did whatever you did, you made the moves you did, you did whatever, and then you guys got back together. And you guys share notes. You share the information. Oh, guess what? I bought this, pro- this housing property by doing this. Oh, yeah, man. I, I learned that if you, at this comedy show, if you make this joke at this time, the audience does that. Oh, yeah. I learned that if you actually can get open LLC and get a life insurance policy on your LLC, da, 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 you got to exchange all these notes. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen is what, what's going to take, what it took you 10 years to learn, you can learn it in two years with a community of guys. Right. It expedites the process. Mr. Beast was just on Joe Rogan explained us exactly what he did to be successful Hmm. so to me i realized that so many men today live in isolation there's they they go especially since covid especially since covid man it it ruined them and so they're learning the hard way the reason why i got to where i am today because i didn't learn the hard way i learned from my dad i learned from um patrick i learned from all these amazing guys i didn't bang my head the hard way Mm -hmm. i learned and so by having the like-minded community not friends you like to party, Adam. I like to party. People don't know this about me. People mm-hmm. who know me know me. I like to party. We're gonna we're gonna party together one day. Hell yeah. We I love partying. That's my that's my thing. But but you know, people you party with are not, they're your party friends. Right. When I want to go to live, mm-hmm. you go with me. When I want to go to story, story's still open. Yeah. Okay, great. When I want to go to story, they go with me. But that's not the people when I'm trying to make money, when I'm right. trying to get the difference better between party friends and business friends when you're 21 did you did you know that oh no i just you're just you're just hanging exactly. with the, your when crew. you're That's when it. you're young you think they're the same thing right but when you're older you realize it's a difference well, this is what we talk about your network is your net worth people that you're partying with are not exactly who you want to be doing business with that that's not who you're going to try to climb the mountain with. you might want to go to the club with them but not necessarily climb the mountain let me i loved everything ahead, you just said ahead. by the way the go standard yeah. and How'd you call it? The 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 radical accountability yeah. with the climbing the mountain, yeah. and, and this is I'm going to circle back to what you said at the beginning of the podcast, and I, and and this brought a commercial that I saw the, uh, that that is pretty poignant. Uh, I was thinking this because you talked about you know when people talk about successful, they want to say oh I'm a black successful black like, everything yeah, you're saying yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah. You saw the commercial where it's like everyone start everyone starts out the same, and the the coach or the guy with the whistle says all right. Take two steps forward if your parents are married. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Mm-hmm. You've seen this? Yeah. Takes two steps forward uh, if both your parents have jobs. Boom, boom, boom. Mm. Takes two steps forward if you've never been to jail. Boom, boom, boom. And they go through a series of questions, yeah. and it's becoming increasingly obvious that the the privileged folk, yeah. typically the white folks in America, they start a little bit further mm-hmm. to the finish line yeah. than maybe minorities or or latinos or blacks or whoever you want to kind of put it there Mm -hmm. um but what you're saying is like i don't really care where you started i don't care if you get to the top of the mountaintop with a rocket ship a humvee with some nice reeboks on Mm -hmm. your feet or if you're barefoot or if you motherfucking have no feet yeah you got to get to the mountaintop 100 percent. is that basically what you're saying because here's the deal adam and i don't want to lack compassion Mm -hmm. for the individuals who have bad outcomes because all in some in, sorry bad initial starts yeah there's a lot of people in today's world you and i both know it i i thought to myself i said imagine imagine you were born during the time of the black plague mm-hmm. and both your parents died what 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 in kind medieval of medieval like, europe yeah, whatever this was there's no internet yeah there was no cars there was no tech you're you're screwed mm-hmm Imagine being born a slave and you were taken away from your family. Some people had some horrible outcomes and life sucks. And I have all the compassion in the world for people who have these terrible outcomes. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is life does not care Mm -hmm. what, what you landed on the dice roll. If the dice roll said two parents, white skin, six, four, bulging biceps Mm -hmm. doesn't matter where you land on a dice roll you still have to live life yeah and so my goal is i understand that but and i'm going to give you all the resources to succeed but at the same time i cannot let you just stay in that victim mindset because life gave you a bad hand Mm -hmm. so like i said i don't want to lack the compassion because there's some guys right now have you read a book called a child called it 
No, I haven't read it. It's a, it's a, it is a international best-selling book. I read it when I was 10 years old about a kid who had one of the worst mothers of all time. His name is David Pulitzer. If you ever interview somebody, that's one of my goals, interview him. I have to be more proactive in getting him. It's this amazing book where he, he has this photographic memory describing how his mom was demonically possessed. I mean this in the most literal of ways. Whoa. Like his mom made him eat his brother's diaper. Pardon? I'm telling you, look it up. A child. Can you put this up? What was his name? Just pull the book up. It's, the book is called A Child Called It. Oh, yes. Of course. Yeah, I haven't read it, but I've yeah, heard, heard about it. Heard it's about a very, it. Yeah. It's a very powerful book. Mm -hmm. This kid went through hell and back. His mother hated him. His mom made his life a living hell. Like, I'm talking about true mm -hmm. evil. Then his next book is called, I think it's called A Lost Boy, where he's in the in the foster care system and just getting abused and beaten. But guess what? He came, he, he made it. Mm -hmm. Most people don't. Right. Most people like him, suicide, unfortunately. Of course. Become criminals. Like they don't make it. Solution oriented or excuse oriented. I mean, he's got every, every excuse in the book, every excuse right? in the book, but he, what? Climbed Made the it. mountain. Climbed the mountain. Yeah. He climbed the mountain with no freaking legs, with no arms, but he somehow got there. I Here's the deal, Adam. I understand it's harder for him to climb the mountain than my privilege behind. Mm -hmm. I'm not black American. I'm Nigerian American. Different, mm -hmm. Totally different ethnicities. Yeah. My superstar, rock star father, amazing mother. I was blessed with amazing friends. I am physically gifted. I am intellectually gifted. I am spoiled. <laughs> I'm see I I'm my chip on my shoulders because my parents said they love me so much other people don't love me as much as my parents do. That's why I'm mad at That's life. That's crazy, dude. I'm so spoiled like that, Adam. I understand my journey is not his journey, but my goal is for the guys like him, I want to give you all the tools to be successful. I know you need more tools, and I'm going to give you more of what you need. But at the same time, it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. It's not okay to stay there. So like I said, I have compassion for those. I'm not, I'm not one of these, you know, individuals who are like, you're super conservative. Oh, no, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. No, some people need assistance. Right. And, I, and I understand that. But what I've learned from being a teacher is some people, you give them all the assistance in the world, and they still want to complain and make excuses. And I have no time for that. Yeah, what do they say that 80% of the people uh, don't care about your problems, the other 20% are happy you got them? Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> Did you have a question for Afiz? Yeah, I mean, well, this is kind of switching Go ahead, a little bit of do. gears, but just based off of the comments, there's a lot of red pill, blue pill, all this <laughs> stuff. It's saying RP, and I'm like, what is RP looking it up? So if we can clear up the muddiness, because I know that that can get lost, right? Yeah. There's a lot of misinterpretation of the red pill, blue pill, and some people are actually saying that you misinterpret the red pill. Me. But first of all, yeah, I don't even know what the red pill is. No, it's, it, it's <laughs> funny. Yeah, explain that. It's, it's funny because... Thank you, David. <laughs> I thank you for that. You're, they're lucky because I, I don't read comments. I don't read comments. Never have. I mean, I used to back when, you know, Gary Vee would tell me to read comments. But oh, really? Yeah, but now I got to a point where I don't read comments. So And why don't you do that? Yeah. To me, it's a false representation of how people really feel. Mm -hmm. uh, because you... It's like amplified? Yeah, because the thing about it is, do you comment on videos? I never have. Do you comment on videos? <laughs> I have. I mean, yeah. I'm not disrespecting anybody who's in the comments today. I have not met a person who's doing well in life who consistently comments on videos. Consistently. Yeah. yeah. And, and some of you might comment once in a blue moon, but yeah. these people, like most people I know, have never commented on videos who are doing very well, who are very productive, who are very happy in life. They don't have time to be spending all their days commenting, sharing their opinions on things that really don't relate to them. So I asked myself, who are the people commenting then? If I've never met anybody personally commenting all the time, who are these guys who are always in the comments? Some of them are emotionally invested in, in what you do and what you do and what I do, and they love us so much they want to share positive things. Which That's is great. great. We That's appreciate great. them. That's Absolutely, great. Yeah. Whenever when Patrick was on Joe Rogan's podcast, I commented. Hell yeah. I loved it so much, man. Shout out to Patrick Bed David, man. Thank you so much. So there's people. Because you felt inspired felt to inspired make a comment. To right. make a, but then there's most then there's people 
Then there's the trolls. Then there's those individuals. Gotta pay the troll toll. Who don't comment (laughs) out of inspiration. Yeah. But they comment out of anger, Mm -hmm. out of frustration. Or sometimes nitpickiness. Yeah, or nitpickiness. So they Like they might say something like, um, you after everything you said, they might be like, Yeah, but Hafiz's shoes are untied. Yeah. It's like yeah, yeah. really, bro. 100%. Nobody's talking about accountability yeah. and being the best version yeah. of yourself. You're focusing on his shoe tie. hundred percent his and, shoelaces. And then my thing is that I need those comments in real life. Mm-hmm. If you want to comment and say something about me, please, people know I'm in I'm in Dallas. I'm 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 at Bottle Blonde. I'm at Citizens. You Bottle know what Blonde, I mean? Bottle Blonde, yeah. That's, that's good. I'm there. Pull up. Pull up. <laughs> I'm there. And it, many many people have pulled up. Yeah. All great things. I don't I don't see those comments. I need those comments in real life yeah. for me to address them. Got but it. we're here. We're here. Let's address some of the comments. Yeah. What a lot of people who are in the Red Pill community have a a lot of followers in the red pill community don't like my representation of the red pill community. Okay. And for those that, that don't like, you don't know the red yeah, pill exactly. versus the blue pill. So, there's other different so types I'll, of pills. I'll, I'll, I covered this with Rolo Tomasi, yeah, but please yeah. recap. This. So let me explain something to the people who are going to be lost in the sauce. When it comes to this conversation, it's such a postmodern conversation. And what I mean by that is in, in the postmodern English language, words are subjective. Okay. Right. So because words are subjective, things don't lack objective meaning anymore. Right. So, for example, let me give a, a simple one. Yo, what's up, dog? What does that mean? Depends. Dog mm-hmm. can mean homie. Dog can mean piece of ass that I don't like. Mm-hmm. Right. It's subjective. But what has happened is the language has broken down so much that two people can. Let's, let's, use, let's use a word and get people fired up. Abortion. Mm-hmm. Some people abortion means ending a fetus. Yeah. Some people abortion means ending a life. There's two different people that that, that war has two completely different meanings. Pro life, pro choice. Mm-hmm. And they and and there's so many other things you can mm-hmm. define. And these words, critical race theory. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Some people it mean you know. So that's what happens. Red pill is one of these words where there's a bunch of people who define it. Mm-hmm. And there's a bunch of people who also define it, and they're battling. So another example, the best example I give, is feminism. What is feminism? When you ask people who are feminists, feminism means the advancement for women, Mm -hmm. advancement of equal rights for women. You ask people in the red pill community what feminism is, bashing men, hatred, misandry, da-da-da-da. What is it? Mm-hmm. What is it? It goes, it's based upon the receiver of the information. Yeah. So I want to make it clear, whenever I define the word, I'm just simply defining a word that there's not even an objective definition yeah, in the community. Just made every, up by a community. Yeah, so and every person has a different definition. You have 17 red pill creators, all 17 have a different definition of it. So to me, I'm just, I know, in my opinion... I personally know almost everybody who I find respectful in the space. I know I can call them on the phone right now and talk to them. There's a few people who I don't know personally, but if I wanted to, I can call them and talk to them on the phone. I, I, I'm not just somebody who, I'm not a part of the community. I'm not somebody who just sits down and shares. I know your, your favorite creator, I know him. So when people are like, oh, you don't know, you don't know. Bro, the people you're worshiping and learning from, I, I can call them on the phone right now. We can talk about I'm your about favorite it. creator's favorite creator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so but wow. what does red pill I'm mean got, to let me you? Get, let me get it. So yeah. red pill is this idea based upon the Matrix, right? So in the right. movie, the Matrix, Neil yeah. the red pill, he woke up to the realities of life. Yeah. Uh, so okay. it's waking up to realities of life, but then it's the realities of life about what? Usually when the people talk about red pill online, mm-hmm. it's realities of inter- um, personal relationships and the dynamics between male nature and female nature. Mm. So it's basically what is the truth about male nature, what is the truth about female nature, and what is the truth about how those two natures work together in relationships. So that's basically understanding red pill. What is the truth about intergender relationships between men and women? That's what the red pill means. But when somebody makes a statement and he said, I, this is the truth it's the truth according to whom? Who? Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? If I'm telling this is the truth, it's the truth according to whom? Like 
like like like Christianity is the truth according to Christ. Judaism is the truth according to Moses. Perfect. Islam is the truth according to Muhammad. Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, Mormonism, Buddhism, Hinduism, yeah, Mormonism, everything. So, so it's the truth according to whom? So right. what red pill creators will say is the truth based upon scientific studies and research that has been gathered together and men all around the world will come together, usually on these message board in the early 2000s, they will come together and share notes. So Adam would be like, yo, I dated these five girls in Miami and this would happen. And David was like, yo, I dated these 10 girls in New York. This would happen. Well, let's not give him too much credit for them. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Two girls in New York. <laughs> you know? Smoking hot. <laughs> <laughs> and so the idea was that this, what, the, what became of the red pill is this, you know, this combination, I, I was thinking about a word, but I couldn't find a word, of all this information, and it's the truth about male nature, mm -hmm. male nature, female nature, interpersonal relationships. But it's based upon what your favorite creator tells you it's the truth. Gotcha. I, I, to be honest, with you, I, I've seen The Matrix. I remember that scene. You want yeah. the red pill or the blue pill? Yeah. Um, it was, uh, what, Lawrence Fishburne, I yeah, believe, yeah, that yeah. Uh, gave me the option. Morpheus, Morpheus. Morpheus. Yeah. I, But I actually interpreted more the red because people started saying as uh, we're doing the pbd podcast and i uh, tend to be more center left i'm thinking more of just a moderate in yeah. general uh a moderate in everything but people would say oh adam's getting red pilled yeah so we're becoming more of a republic i'm yeah, just so, like no nah, i'm just yeah i'm me yeah so so red pill think. can also be politics yeah so if you were a democrat and you're opening your eyes to how democratic establishments x y and z mm -hmm. you can become a red pill about democrats if you were you know maybe blinded by woke politics and you're now starting to see that it's wrong you can be mm -hmm. red. so it's now become more than that but usually the guys online the guys that are commenting right now they're usually talking about it in relation to interpersonal relationships mm -hmm. and the truth about interpersonal relationships especially in the modern era Got so it. quotes on the truth and it's the truth and like i said they will tell you it's based upon the objective studies but when you ask a more majority of these guys show me these objective studies that you know these quotes because i know all the data yeah i know everything that you guys know i follow all these people there's a reason why when they come on my podcast one of the guys came on my podcast he was like yo you did a lot of research about me and i'm impressed I said, it's not research. I just know this stuff as much as you do. Mm -hmm. I've been in this as long as you. I've, naturally, being a person who helps men, I learn from everybody. I've researched everybody. I've researched the very religious guys, the secular red pill guys. I've learned from everybody. So I'm very well versed in all types of languages. So what they're always communicating to me is that I am misunderstanding them, but I believe what they're doing is they're believing in ideology that's being communicated to them by individuals that, in my personal opinion, are not leading them in the best direction. Yeah. And they're so dogmatically trapped in this, in this ideology, whether they consider it an ideology or not. And so when I make my criticisms of the ideologies, like me, I'm a Christian. If somebody cr criticized Christianity because I'm so dug into it, I'm going to push back. They're so dug into these ideologies. Whenever I criticize them, they're not going to be happy. And I understand it. Got it. Is does this, that answer your question, David? Yeah. And is, does this relate also to the is it M, MG MGTO? MGTO. 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 Men going their own way. Mig I learned that with yeah. Fresh and Mig Fit. Mig okay. MGTO is, is men going their own way. So what is that even? So, like? so, you can go your own way. <laughs> so MGTO is, let's say... There's a spectrum, right? Okay. And in the middle is like the balanced perspective. You want to be the most balanced possible. Far left is like male feminist. The guy at the rally with the pussy hat on. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you honestly believe I'm like no, that? No, but... Because this is my thing. Like, okay. they people believe that I'm this, like, the guy with the pussy hat on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When all I say, I'm like, just don't... Why do you have to be a dick about it? Like, yeah. a lot of this feels like I'm the victim. Being a man is so hard. Women, they just are. I have to be. I'm like, dude, just shut the fuck up. Like, don't be a dick to women. Just be the best version of yourself. Don't be a dick to anyone. And that's it. And like, it's not. It. I feel like a lot of the red pill yeah. is also like, yeah, it's like very pessimistic. Like, yeah, and and so it's like real. I'm dude. I'm just being a realist. But everything it, is pessimism. Go, There's no light. I love that because going back to that, to me. It goes, I asked, I asked Robert Greene of the 48 Laws of Power. Mm -hmm. I asked him a question. I said, I said, 
from all your research, from all your understanding, from all the things that you've done, do you believe most human beings have good intentions and occasionally do bad things? Or do most human beings have bad intentions and occasionally do good things? Robert Greene told me he believes most human beings have good intentions and occasionally do bad things. What do you believe? I agree with that. I think that most you? people have good intentions and they'll occasionally do some bad things. And obviously there's some a few bad apples. And mm -hmm. I think there was a stat that um, ninety five percent of the this was a former CIA FBI operative. He came into value team and he said, "Well, you know, ninety five percent of the world does do good things, wants to do good things, but then the five percent. But if you take five percent of eight billion people, 100%. and that's you know, I, quick math, a couple hundred million, it's yeah. like yeah, that's why you got so many fucking crazy people out there. Yeah, and I, I mean, I totally agree with that. I think most people do good things and just or have good intentions and occasionally do bad things, but then those good intentions are subjective, right? Because mm -hmm. I think. Take the example with Putin right now. He thinks he's doing a good thing. Yeah. The entire world is like, dude, he can fucking invade a country, but he's mm -hmm. doing, I got to do it for Russia. Yeah. Do you disagree with Robert Greene? I agree with him. Okay. And so I asked him, is this true for men? Mm -hmm. And is this true for women? He said, yes. So it goes back to that framework. What do you believe the other person's intentions are? So one of my biggest criticisms of the red pill movement happened because most people don't know this about the podcast is that I try to be as balanced as possible. Mm -hmm. I try to get far right and far left. I want to, I want, I want, um, Roland Martin. I want Umar Johnson. I also want Candace Owens. You know, I, I want everybody. Mm -hmm. I want to learn from everybody. Of course. And so I got some guys who people consider like the opposite of red pill. I interview them. Like, what is that? That's blue pill. What is that? Yeah, they would, they would consider these guys blue pill men. I don't consider them that, but the internet would consider them that. So what, what, what's blue, blue so pill? So basically the, the concept of blue pill is going back to the matrix is like you're oblivious to the truth and you're living in a lie. So you're mm -hmm. so like basically. You just want to feel secure. You don't yeah. want to have bad things happen. You, you don't yeah. want the harshness of you the real world so, so, to yeah. take over. So like Can't basically a, a person truth, who would quote unquote be blue pill is a person who's naive to the realities of life. They think, you know, yeah. w women are these perfect angels. And if you just love them just enough, every woman will love you equally. Right. Yeah, that's not it's, it either. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 <laughs> it's neither. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm going to explain to you the criticism because I, I hope I'll answer your question. So I, I went on tour with three of the biggest dating coaches in the world. And I was a camera guy. I went on tour with three of the biggest dating coaches in the Who world. Who were they? It was um, Derek Jackson, the guy Red Pill guys hate. Um, they really hate this guy. My mentor, Stefan Labossier, is a, is a beast. And a guy who, another guy they don't really like named Ace Metaphor. I went on tour with these three guys. And on this tour, we, there, it was 95% women. And we would go to these venues, thousands of women. It, Atlanta, Miami, New York. Man, it's fun. <laughs> but, and I sat and I was a camera guy. And they, at the end of each show, they would do a Q&A. Hmm. And they would do this Q&A and they would get these women to talk about their issues and ask the guys questions. And during this time is when I learned the most about women. Because I was actually meeting, not online, yeah. not reading a book, not watching a, a bunch of guys bringing girls that they've chosen and curated. I just met thousands of different women and got to hear them all talk. And I would hear them talk about things about men. And you would hear these generalizations. All men cheat. Men are liars. Why do men do this? Why do? And you would hear them complain. And then you'll see a woman who's respectfully like 350 pounds and was like, we're all the good guys. All I find is guys who want to sex with me. The men are not serious. And it's like, well, maybe if you got in your best shape and you got physically fit, you could change your outcome. This is radical accountability. Radical accountability. So I would, I would <laughs> talk about radical. So I would see, <laughs> I would see all these things and I, and I would be like, this is crazy. Like they, they, first they would overgeneralize, then they would not take accountability. So move forward, fast forward to now I'm in the men's space. And literally the same things I heard from the women, I hear from the guys. Radical generalizations of women, usually, like David said, from a pessimistic worldview, because the mm. truth is pessimistic. Yeah. The truth isn't that most women are actually good people with good intention and do bad things. The truth yeah. is most women are selfish, yeah. hypergamous people out to get you to take half your money, to take custody of your kids from you. That's these messages that are being communicated. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lack of accountability. Well, the average women don't want average men. These yeah, girls exactly. don't want us. There's not a accountability where, yo, do you know if you put in the work for the next five years to become your best version of yourself, you would no longer be average. You, if you, hell, three years, 
If you put in three years of work, you would no longer be average. So that that whole sentence wouldn't apply to you. I would see both these things and I would see how bitter and hurt the women were. Because if because the reason you're so emotional is because you were bitter and you were hurt by a guy. That's what causes generalizations. You, mm-hmm. These women were hurt by men. They become bitter. They be, then, then they generalize. And then I saw the guys the same thing. Guys would call me. Guys would call me in. And I would see a lot of these guys are hurt. When your girlfriend cheated on you, how do you feel? You're hurt. When your wife divorced you, took your money, how do you feel? You're hurt. When your baby mama took away custody of your children, you're paying child support, how do you feel? You're hurt. When the girl of your dreams told you that you're an ugly loser, I'll never be with you, how do you feel? Mm-hmm. You're hurt. The guys are hurt, and I called it for what it was. And they're acting emotional, not logical. Is that basically what you're saying? I'm not saying they're acting. That, yes, but my main point was that they got offended when I said they were hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you are hurt. Yeah. And and they, they take it like it's a sign of weakness as a man to be hurt. I've been hurt. You've mm-hmm. been hurt. We've all been hurt. There's nothing wrong with a man being hurt. I'm just calling it for what it is. Mm-hmm. And so to me, like I said, the, the, the problem with all these things is at the end of the day, my goal is that if any man is listening to this message... If they take anything from what we communicated, if you simply view the opposite gender as the villain and you the victim, you will never win. Exactly. You will never win. Wow. You will. Ne- it's just impossible because it's because it's. Think about it. Imagine there's a woman who views men as the villain and, the, and she's a victim. Would a man of character? Would a man of integrity? Would a man of sensibility want to be with her? No. She would be too negative. He wouldn't want to stay with her for long. Yeah. So the same thing is true as a man. And also, if you are a man. Instead of simply being bitter, if you want to be better, put in the work to become the best version of yourself physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. If you commit to that for three years of your life, see what happens to your outcomes. Compound interest. Literally. Let me ask you. Go ahead. Um, Let's get into relationships for a second. Uh, We kind of touched on that a little bit right there. You brought up the you know, the concept of hypergamy. Yeah. Where do you stand on this? Do you believe that this it's a real thing, the concept of hypergamy? Yes and no. It's real, but it's exaggerated. How and so? it's and it's subjective. Girl, you as a man, my goal for men is get off the internet. One of our themes this year is life happens offline. One of my goals with the standard is we we do events offline. Mm-hmm. We're not just a bunch of guys typing on message boards and Reddit sharing our theories. No, guys, hey, let's go out. Let's go here. Let's let's experience life. When you experience life, you experience a diversity of women. You and I both know there's women in Miami mm-hmm. who, based upon what car you pull up in, is going to determine whether she dates you or not. Yeah, that's we, why I don't have a car. <laughs> it came in, I swear to God, that's one of the reasons I don't have a car. It's I like, love it. Judge me now. I'm just Ubering everywhere. I love it. So there's you see are, my apartment, you'll know what kind of guy uh, you're working you with. You got to let okay. him know something, Adam. You got to <laughs> let him know something. So there are those women on that end of the spectrum. But there are women... Like a uh, great example is a Courtney Ryan. She's a great content creator. You should interview her when you, if you get the chance. There are women who are in the Midwest who are really simple people. Yeah, of course. They're very simple women. Yeah, they there's don't a really... big difference between a girl in Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa versus L.A, South Beach. It's and, a totally And the problem is that they've made it in their brains that they're all the same. Mm-hmm. And any man who's actually traveled knows they're not the same. There's a, there's a staunch difference in dating girls in Miami, Florida than dating girls in Des Moines, Iowa. We all know that if you've been to both those cities. So if hypergamy, there is a level of that biologically mm-hmm. because usually you look at evolutionary bio- biologists, they'll tell you across all f- a species, yes, the women would want that. But to me, how does my question is, it's not about hypergamy being true, but how does that affect you? Would you break down what your, I assume your wife, your best relationship is yeah and the difference between that and your worst relationship you've ever had with a female so to, someone you were dating 100 percent. and to me it was me 100 percent radical accountability it was me when the man i became from 19 to 29 when i met my wife was not the man i was when i was 19 years old when i met a girl i thought i was gonna marry mm-hmm. i as a man was delusional because a lot of guys with pornography 
You think you're the pizza boy. You been finna smash Miss Jane. Miss, Miss Jane. You know, Miss Lisa Ann. You know what Lisa I mean? Lisa Ann. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you think that's that's gonna be you. Yeah. You watch these TV shows where the typical story, like Fairly Odd Parents, you have this loser, nerdy kid named Timmy Turner. And who does he want? Does he want Trudy Tang? No, he's not sorry, Trudy Tang. Does he want Trudy? No, he doesn't want Trudy. He wants Trixie Tang, the hottest girl in school. <laughs> you see these these messages and you watch these Disney Channel movies where the, the lowly loser nerdy guy can get the hottest girl in school so your brain is conditioned to think that because i'm a guy if i like her she should want me back so and they get frustrated when they get no love and they get frustrated and get hurt when they get no love mm -hmm. and so to me i always wanted the top tier women i was never a top tier guy so that was where i was losing and you had to look in the mirror and be like yo bro you got to step your life up. i had to Mm -hmm. And that's the part that hurts people. It's, it's a hard thing to do. Of course. I'm telling you, it's like... So much easier to blame and not easy. take accountability. Did, She's a bitch. My boss is an asshole. You're a dick. It's so much harder it's to be like, so dude, easier. you're 30 pounds overweight. You're not actually working as hard as you could. You're not hitting the gym. You're actually kind of a dick. You, like, you're, you're, you're negative. Like, it's so much harder to do that. It's so much easier to blame shift. 100% Adam. And to me, that is the radical accountability starts off mm -hmm. with. It's, and, and, and when I got radical, I realized, what am I talking about? <laughs> why, why would that kind of woman want me? And so there's this idea in the world of men where because I am me, I should get the top tier women. But that's not true in anything in life. Because I am me, I should be the number one basketball player in the in NBA. Right. Because I am me, I should be the number one singer in the world. There's nothing in life where just maybe in your mom's world, right. you can be you and be the king of the right. planet. Maybe in the world of participation trophies, yeah. you can just show up and get an award. Not but how life works. Life, you have to work for what you yeah. want. You have to ask yourself, what do I want? Do I, do I, do I want to be financially chilling like Adam? Well, I got to do the work that men who financially chill right. do. And so to me, it got me to that point where I realized in the past I was an average, a, a little above average guy. But I wanted top notch. Adam, I, I'm the pickiest guy. <laughs> I'm the pickiest. Pornography is poison. But back when I used to watch porn, I would have to go to seven. I'd be on page 17 until I found the one I liked. That's how picky I was. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of time there. I had to go through a lot of time because I was so picky. And so to me, I acknowledged it was my fault. Yeah. So no what, what changed? What changed? What made you say, all right, like what did you actually step by step do and say, all right, let me look in the mirror, give some accountability. What changed? True did story. You, did you get wealthier, smarter, better looking, in shape? Like what did you actually have so to what do? So what did I do? Or what, what, what was the light what switch? Clicked? Yeah. The light switch happened. The aha moment. And then True what did story. you actually True do about story. that? Yeah. I moved to Houston because of a girl. Mm -hmm. I, I have theories. I have so many theories. I spent 10 years. I have a book of theories. And I test out all. I'm like a, a doctor who does all experiments on himself. So I don't tell any man to do anything I haven't done myself. Had a theory. There was a girl I really liked. She was into me. I had a theory to make her into me. I tested it out and moved to Houston. Obviously, it never works. Don't do it. <laughs> but, don't move because of a girl. But then, I, but then I realized that's when it dawned on me. I was like, yo, look at where you're at. You did all this for a girl, but what did you do for yourself? Mm -hmm. Damn, powerful. What did you do for yourself? How were you different? Were you better or were you worse? Were you just the same? And I realized, okay, let me look at the kind of women that I want. Who are they married to? What kind of men do they like? And let me be honest about where I'm at. So hard to do. I was in Houston. I was sleeping on the couch. With my friend's place. Literally sleeping on the couch. Not even not some people tell you a story that, like I was literally sleeping on yeah. the couch. You moved to Houston for her? You couldn't even stay at her place? Of course I'm you won't let me stay at her place. <laughs> what the heck? What me don't in prison? <laughs> like you wouldn't let me in there. <laughs> but you were dating her. No. Oh, oh what? That's what I'm saying. I test everything out. I'm a crazy guy, Adam. <laughs> I'm a you crazy... moved there because you liked a girl. Yes. You weren't even dating her. No. That's bold. Hafiz. I'm, a, Hafiz. I'm telling you. Okay, I hey, learned... man, you had to hit rock bottom I, sleeping so on guys, the couch in order to but, figure it out. That's why guys relate to me because I'm never a guy talking about I banged 100 yeah. chicks. I did all this. I was a guy at rock bottom who, just like most guys, was struggling, who was upset, who yeah. cried at night over girls, and I learned how to make myself better. That was my rock bottom point. 
what did I do? Yeah. The first thing I realized was as a man, first things first is presentation. I'm a visual person. I like women who look a certain way. Mm -hmm. So are most men. So, so are most men. Shout out to the men. So men, you got to realize if you like a woman who looks a certain way, if you and her took a pic picture together, do you guys match? Do you guys match? Does it make it? Does it even make any sense? Because she, if she looks a certain way physically, she, a sort of mating, would probably want someone who looks a certain way physically as well. And physically, as a man, doesn't also necessarily mean the face. It can mean the clothes. Mm -hmm. It can mean the style. It can mean your mannerisms, the confidence, all these different things. So I realized I, as my, as a man, have not got those things situated, which is what got me into style, which is what got me into suits. Because I tell men all the time, you want to feel like what it's like to get plastic surgery as a like like a woman's yeah. effect. Put on a, a well tailored suit and live life. Right. Well, they say that to a man, the hottest thing a woman can wear is lingerie. Yes. And to a woman, the hottest thing a man can wear is a fresh suit. I'm telling you, I'm doing it, Hafiz. David, Davy Dollars, <laughs> hot tracksuit. <laughs> <laughs> and so. I have so many stories about suits, we don't have time yeah. for it. So, styling. Yeah. I realized, okay, styling I have to work on. So, then there was things about internally as a man. I was not on my purpose. I spent most of my whole focus was to get a woman. Instead of becoming the best man that God made me to be. So, instead of spending all day long waiting for a text back, Instead of spending all day long swiping on Tinder or swiping on Hinge, I say, you know what? Let me put all my time and energy into building my business. Mm -hmm. And then, at, then what I would do is with my remaining time, I would spend it dating. You know what that does for 99% of men? It makes you less needy. Off that alone, dude. off that alone will make you less needy. Right. Because now you actually have things to do. When you text a woman and she don't text you back, sometimes she's not interested. Most of the time she's not interested, but sometimes she's actually doing stuff. The reason why you're waiting for a text back because you have you're not doing anything. Yeah. yeah. And so to me, as a man, and you're sitting around watching yeah. your phone. She's gonna text. We've all been there. We've all been there. I've been there. Now, my when whole you're life. freaking busy and you're accomplishing things and you're succeeding, you're like, I forgot to even text her. Exactly. Or I didn't even remember if she texted. Like, exactly. I'm telling you that happens. Exactly. So then I started building the, the my purpose, and then I started to realize, okay, what were some of the things that turned women off for me? Mm -hmm. The neediness, the wanting too much time, and I started working on those things, fit, getting back in my best shape. I played college football. I went vegan for a couple of years. I lost twenty something pounds. I became like. Skeletor, like the guy from Nightmare Before Christmas, I got back in the gym. Mm -hmm. I just started building, like literally building pieces, learning from other guys. Like, oh, wow, he did this. He does that. And I started improving it bit by bit, piece by piece. Got my own place. Stop living with seven guys. Sometimes it's okay. Nothing wrong with that to save money. Yeah. But if you're going to want a relationship, it's hard. Two things I learned. It's hard to always tell her to come over. When it's seven other guys you live Dude, with. Dude, yeah. <laughs> and it's also hard as a man to always go to her place because now it's this psychological shift where now you're always coming to her. I call it home court advantage. I why do you think that? that why, why do you think that, you know, playoffs, you know, you want game I'm seven. Telling you, Adam. At home. And, and you see this? I didn't learn this in a book. Me and Adam, I'm, I'm talking about these ideas. Yeah. Adam related because we went through experience. 100%. When men go out into life, we live life. We learn these things from experience. Men don't got to learn from experience. So all these little things from improving myself style-wise, getting back in the, into the gym, then also having other guys with me. Because one thing that I've told people all the time is that when you see in a very attractive group of girls, yep. what you don't realize is they're not as hot as you think they are sometimes. It's just that there's an eight, there's a seven, there's a nine, there's a six, there's a four. Like, you're just adding them all up. Is that yeah, what you're saying? It's not, it's that, but it's like five sevens, because there's no weak link, yeah. you think they're all nines. Ah, gotcha. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so what I realized is as a man, you have strength in, in community and togetherness. It's one thing for me to go out wearing a suit. I said the weird guy wearing a suit, yeah. depending on how you rock it. But you and the homies roll out with bro, the suits? It's a wrap. It. It's a wrap. Yeah. It's a wrap, Adam. Yeah. It's a whole new world. So I learned there's also the power of community, of having other guys, because that that creates... Suit it up, bro. I'm trying to tell you. I got the, you said suit. That's what I got. <laughs> uh, we got about 
10 minutes left. Okay, I want to cover a few different well, things. Go, I know go. you've got an airport. Yeah. Uh, last thing with, with relationships. On one of your podcasts recently, you talked about looks, but no personality. Yeah. Uh, but personality, but no looks. Yeah. So why did you cover this? What does this mean? Uh, and what should people understand about that? Yeah. So to me, basically, we have a show with women. Um, we used to do it in season one, but we moved from Houston, so we had to put a pause in them, but we, we bring it back. The goal of that is to show positive interaction between men and women. Mm -hmm. Like my, One of the things I love the most about the show is that the women leave learning and feeling happy. And it's creating optimism about the uh, from the cynical dating perspective. So we were having a lot of fun. But basically, the, the concept I was making is that though as a man... You can have a great personality and be a great person. That's kind of what people learn during the interview. But your exterior is the resume. So as a man, you want to have a great resume and a great be a great interviewer. So unfortunately, in today's world, a lot of men just simply believe, I'm a great guy. I'm a great person. That's all that matters to her. And it's like, that's imagine someone saying oh guess what i'm a great employee hire me you say it but there's other things that i need as well to see your qualifications and so the the general idea like i said that was more of a fun topic but the the the, the we do fun topics to get the deeper messages mm -hmm. but the deeper message was as a man you also want to build up your exterior while building up your interior, it's not just being a, a, a great, um, I mean, an attractive person. It's being an attractive man and a great man. So it's this idea where a lot of people either focus on one or the other. You know, you have the guys who's all looks, all money, no character. The guys who are all character, you know, all kindness, all this, but no attractiveness. The best man, the ultimate man, is a combination of both. And that's what every man can be if they put in the work. Triple threat. Yeah. Um. Let's talk money real quick. Let's this is a, a, you know, a financial show at the end of the day that we do cover a lot of topics. So you know, your last job was teaching, then you turned to videography, now you're making money on YouTube. Yeah. So how do you make money on YouTube? What advice do you have for content creators? And then when you're making the money, what have you learned about managing your money? What's the best financial lesson you've learned? 100%. To me, to make money on YouTube, you gotta do it for at least five years. And that's the part nobody wants to listen to. Yeah. Is there an exception to the rule where you just do a video and it goes viral? Sure. It's one video, though. 100%. You have to be so consistent. I love Patrick Bird Davids. I'll improve, I'll innovate, I'll strategize, I'll last the competition. Mm -hmm. So when you're the content creators who are really making money, my advice to you is go to their videos and go to oldest videos. <laughs> yeah. Nine years, yeah. 12 years, 11 years, 10 years. They've been at it for a minute. If it was easy, everyone would do it. If it was easy, everyone would do exactly. it. So to me, it's a question of yeah. can you consistently each week for five years in a row put out videos? That's the first question you have to ask yourself. When we started, a lot of people started with us. Nobody's there with nobody else who we started with is also doing content. So as a man, as a creator, you have to be consistently doing this for at least five and years. And you've only been doing it three years. YouTube. Okay, YouTube. YouTube, yeah, you're right. We've been to YouTube for three and a half, four years. So you're even acknowledging, look, I'm not even where I need to no, be right now. No, of course not. Of course not. Yeah. Of course not. I'm not even close. But this is what you do full time. Yeah. Though. Yeah, I'm not even close. And then you also have to have radical accountability and ask yourself, if I'm not getting the views I want, is it because I'm not good? Mm. What's that, like what am I doing wrong with yeah. content? Yeah, because mm -hmm. to me it's like if you're not if you're if you're always getting cut by your high school Agreed. basketball team, it might be your coach is a dick. Yeah, yeah. It might be there's a superstar team where you would have been a superstar on another team, but it might be you're just not good in basketball. Yeah. Well, yeah. how can you tell the difference? To me, it goes back to what I asked Gary Vee that exact question: the difference between delusion and perseverance. Mm -hmm. And what Gary Vee says, you have to see something, meaning you need to see progression. Right. There Are needs to be some part of improvement. So if, yeah. you, if you're doing content from year one, you're getting 10 views. Year five, you're getting 11. To me, it's just like, that's progression. But bro. Yeah, you didn't really you have did, progress. You didn't yeah. have progress. You should be seeing consistent growth. Yeah. yeah. And you should, be, you should look back to your old content and kind of cringe. 
Because you've grown and elevated so much. Hundred percent. Right. I have dude. people I went to high school with that I've been hearing since high school, dude. I'm I'm rapping. I'm making music. I'm gonna be the next big thing. Yeah. Still, I'm like, y'all, y'all wait for me, like, dude. It's been like, like ten years, yes. dude. Yeah. So, maybe it's not for you. Um, now that you're started to monetize your yeah. brand, it's been three, four years. You you haven't hit the five year mark, but you're starting to make some yeah. money. What financial lessons have you learned? What's I, like the thing that this. sticks out and says, you know what, dude? I did not know this when I was a teacher making nothing. Let me tell you now something. Now that I'm making some bread, here's what I got. I love, I love your question, Adam. I said the first year you make money is what I call shock money. You're shocked by how much money you make. And you're shocked by how fast money can leave. Mm -hmm. There's no way for you to understand how fast money can leave your wallet until you make that first year salary. That's why you never, ever want to be a one-hit wonder. Yeah. Never. That's the worst. Your worst fear is you do go on YouTube, your first year successful. And you make a lot of money. Because what happens is that first year, that money means nothing. Mm -hmm. It means nothing. I don't, I don't view myself as successful. I just don't. People do. I don't. I don't. It's like basically why uh, I think 80% of lottery winners lose the money in like the it's first It's shock year. money. Exactly. Because you don't, you don't realize, Adam, at one point, you go to, let's say you go to the club. You and I both like going to the club. You go to the club, maybe before you buy a table in Las Colinas in a little there for $200. But now you can go to the club, live, and spend 5000 in a night. Before you maybe could buy some Nikes for 100 Now you can buy Balenciagas for 1000 All of a sudden, money, once you have more money, you have opportunities to spend more money. And people don't realize that until you actually get the money. And so to me, there was a lot of things outside of my control I had to spend money on. But I was shocked because I was always a, I was always a good saver. So let's say, for example, I, I made 50000 as a teacher. I was able to save 10000 mm -hmm. So I was like, bro, I can live off $40,000 a year. So if I made 100000 yeah. I technically could be able to save 60000 right? Because I only need to live off 40000 Then you make 100000 like... Only got twenty five thousand dollars saved. Mm -hmm. What happened to the whoa, whoa, whoa? So you don't you don't realize that you get shocked by you this. Know, there's money. a terminology for that. What it's called you? lifestyle creep. I love it. It's called lifestyle creep, right? Yeah, I was just about to throw it back to you, Thank Adam. You, buddy. Yeah. Well, what I tell people all the time is that okay, you were making fifty thousand as a teacher. Awesome. Now you're making a hundred thousand. Yeah. You were able to save ten thousand. Okay, so you're gonna say, all right. Well, you know, it's that deserve mentality. Uh, well, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm making more money now. Yeah, I deserve yeah, a right. nicer car. Yeah, 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 yeah. I deserve a nicer threads. Yeah, yeah. I just, you know, and next thing you know, so what I tell people is if you're making 50 and that's what you're used to, and all of a sudden you get a raise and you're making 100, you're making 80, live like you're still making 50 for yeah. one year. Yeah. 100%. You've done it for a handful of years now. Do it for one more year. Yeah. And that 50K difference, that 40K difference, boom, that's in your pocket. And when that's sitting in your checking account, you're able to invest, your life will change. 100%. If you continue to spend that, Spend that money rather than save that money. You're never going to get ahead. 100%. We got about five minutes left, yeah. but I want to get your thoughts on this. Go ahead. You've interviewed some pretty prominent people, yeah, bro. Yeah. I've seen your stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what I want to, I want to, what I want to do now is sort of a rapid fire, and I want to call it lessons learned yeah. with Hafiz. Yeah. One second. Okay. Let me check my flight. Let me see how, how much time I have exactly. Ooh. I want to confirm exactly. This will be okay. a lesson learned with Hafiz. Okay. Don't this miss <laughs> that flight. Okay. I want to be 100. percent Missing the flight would be uh, definitely. No, Actually, no, I missed I'm my really, first flight I'm good. I'm good. I'm okay, good. Gotcha. We're good. We're, we're good. Well, we'll wrap up in the no, next we're ten. We're, then we're good. We're good. We're good. Um, dude, I gotta get somewhere tonight. Yeah, hey, listen, <laughs> man, listen. <laughs> no, 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 go, go, go for another hour. Like, yeah. All right, so I want I'm calling this lessons learned with Uffies. Okay, cool. And I'm basically, I'm gonna, I want to get your take on the people that you've interviewed. Yeah. And maybe keep your answer, not a one word answer, yeah. but like, boom, in a sentence yeah. or two, this is what I got from this guy. This is what I took. And this is what this person stands for. Pretend you have a flight you? to catch. Okay. Pretend <laughs> you have a flight to catch. I love it. I'm long so number one, I want to start with my mentor, my boss, my CEO, yeah. Patrick Bed David. You'd interview him a few times. Yes. What's your lesson learned? Dragon with you energy. He's a dragon. He's powerful. And this man taught me that there's levels to success in life. And you can never judge somebody based on what they have until you actually know how much work they put to get what they have. Hmm. Well said, bro. Yeah. Uh, you've inter interviewed Jordan Peterson. Yeah. We've had him on the podcast, yeah. on PBD podcast recently. Yeah. Brilliant mind. What lesson learned did you learn from JP? Goat wisdom. There's, there's, there's a thing about living life and actually experiencing the ups and downs, the dark, the dark, um, nights of the soul to where you get wisdom that can really transform people's souls 
and you and what he has in his brain mm -hmm. it's it's remarkable god-given wisdom and so to me um jp's absolute beast and he's an absolute he's absolute scalpel of understanding the issues that are going on in society yeah it's incredible how he breaks down issues and Freaking. processes some of the things that throws his mind and he's got an amazing beautiful daughter michaela yeah. you've interviewed her yeah what's your lesson learned with michaela peterson michaela peterson to me i she's a she's an overcomer People don't realize her autoimmune, uh, autoimmune disease mm -hmm. really crippled her drastically when she was younger. But she's so positive, she's so optimistic, and she doesn't she doesn't allow her circumstances, to, multiple surgeries, to dictate her be uh, to her life. So that that woman is a warrior, and she's overcoming. And I love that about her because a lot of people would have went through what she went through and just had a victim mindset. What about Gary V? Gary V is a rock star, and what I love about Gary V is that you can look a man in his eyes and see what he stands for. That's the thing about online. A lot of people, you you, you can't tell them, you can't tell who they are because you don't look at them, look them in the eyes. A lot of content creators, people worship. If you look that man in his eyes, you realize that he's not what he's about. If you look a man in his eyes, you know what he's about. When I look Gary V in his eyes, Gary V freaking cares. Mm. Gary V looked at me and he made me feel like I was the only person in the world. Like he cares. That's why he's great. Not because he's the smartest. Gary freaking cares. You can't fake that. As a preschool, second grade teacher, kids realize that. They mm -hmm. know the teachers who care. They know the teachers who don't. Gary V freaking cares. Wow. Uh, you've interviewed Ben Shapiro, yes. I believe. Uh, conservative thought leader. Yeah. What's your lesson learned Human from Ben robot. Shapiro? Human robot. Yeah. Human robot. Let me tell you. Ben the, Shapiro here. Let me hear it. I'm writing that. So <laughs> let me tell you what Ben Shapiro does that people don't realize. When you and I talk, this is what happens. Let's say me and David are talking. As David's talking, I'm, write, I'm writing down what he's saying. After I write it down, I read it. Then I write my response. And then I talk to him. That's how people usually talk. They listen. They're receiving it. Then they're processing their response. Ben Shapiro is doing both at the same time. <laughs> As you're talking, he's yeah. by the time you're done, boop, he has a whole speech plan. The speed yeah. People don't realize this. When you're talking to Ben, the, the speed of the conversation. Yeah. You see it online, but you have to experience it. It's like he's, a machine. Yeah, he speaks he's, I listen thinks. to a lot of people on 2.0. Yeah. Like if I want to, it's called chunking. All right, I want to leave there. I want to listen. I'm going to get... I can only listen to Ben Shapiro on 1.0. No, if I try yeah. to go to 1.5 or 2.0 on Ben Shapiro, <laughs> can't even do it. Anyway, so that's a very good breakdown. Machine. You've also uh, interviewed Candace Owens. Yeah, yeah. What's your take on her? Candace Owens is a freaking beast. She's a woman who can become president. She, uh, I, I want to see her debate like an AOC. I think that will be amazing. I think everyone's like to see that. C yeah. Candace Owens, yo, Candace Owens comes with like, Candace Owens to me, it's funny that she has a beef with Cardi B. Candace Owens should have been a rapper. <laughs> she should have been a rapper. Like she has that, flow. she has that kind of swagger that kind yeah. of like, mm, mm, like you want, like I'm gonna I'm a go at you. Mm -hmm. Like I, I love to see more of it in person, but Candace, yo, that's, that, that's, that's, yo, she, she got it, man. She's got that swag. Yeah. Uh, these are my guys right here. David, I don't know if these are his guys. These are my guys, but you've, uh, you've interviewed, you've sat with, uh, fresh and fit. Yeah, yeah. All right, Myron and Walt. Yeah. What's your take on those boys? Man. Two alphas. <laughs> Not <laughs> my words. Their yeah. words. I, I'm just. I, at the end of the day, while I disagree with the red pill philosophy, I've told Myron and Fresh they notice. He got my number. They can call me whenever. I respect anyone trying. In a world full of people who want to criticize men, in a world full of people who want to sit on the sidelines and type in the YouTube comments and shame and attack people, they're trying to help mm -hmm. men. Are there, are there methodologies, things I agree with? No. Are some of the things I agree with, some of the things they agree with? No. But I respect them, and they're trying to help, and they're mm -hmm. very kind people. I'm a judger. My advantage is most people, I got to meet them in person. So I don't judge people off of viral yeah. videos or crazy moments online. Myron, one of the most hospitable, he's probably mad at me right now, I didn't call him in Miami. One of the most hospitable human beings on the planet. So I love that they're trying to help men. They're, as me, they're gonna make mistakes along the way, they're gonna figure it out, they're gonna improve their message, mm -hmm. but they're trying. And, and as a guy who makes a lot of mistakes, who's offended a lot of people, who said a lot of things wrong, I can respect any man who's gonna put himself out there and to try to help people, nothing but great things for yeah. what they're 
you're trying He's to got good intentions. Yeah. Uh, they're doers, not complainers. I, yeah, uh, I you've interviewed that. Kevin Samuels. Yeah. What's yeah. your lesson learned from Kevin Samuels? Man, Kevin Samuels, the OG, man. Kevin Samuels, what I learned from Kevin is that, you know, Kevin, Kevin to me, is the most misunderstood person. Um, and I blame YouTube for it. Hmm. But Kevin, but what I learned from Kevin is that there comes a time where you need the harsh truth. Whether you can receive it from an outsider or not, but you you need it and it will transform your life. I I I love Kevin because me and Kevin talk the same way. And I get in trouble a lot <laughs> for my dad because of the way I talk growing up. So I, re, I, we, I like that kind of, in Nigeria, call it anyway, better, better, that spicy talk. I like it. And Ooh, so spicy. And so to me, Kevin is a person who, um, who's, who gives it. And the thing about Kevin is he's the same way online as he is in person. And so Kevin, nothing but great things to say about Kevin mm -hmm. Samuels. And, and he gives the truth and he stands by where a lot of men will fall. Um, and with her away. So nothing but great things. Shout out to the OG, um, Kevin Samuels. What about this guy called Alpha Male? AMS, to me, is one of the greatest human beings on the freaking planet. AMS, like I said, with the Red Pill guys, we don't always agree. AMS is a best, one of the best humans I've met. Mm -hmm. Literally, AMS, whenever something happens, he calls me. He gave me advice about my um, Roth IRA. He gave me advice about my SEP IRA. Um, he gave me advice about my, my medical plan. This guy is such an amazing human being. Hmm. The internet will never appreciate AMS. Why is that? Because he, he's online, he's AMS. But in person, he's one of the greatest. Not saying he's not great online, but you know, online, it's, it's humor, it's comedy style, it's jokes, it's funny. But when you, like, they kind of, like, for him, to, he would call me out of the blue and be like, yo, do this. They'll make your money go from 3000 to 7000 did it and exactly what happened. Wow. Just for no reason. He, nothing, I will never have anything but great things to say about AMS. That's awesome, yeah. bro. Um, this is what I'm going to call the unsung hero. Who did I not name that you're like, you forgot to ask me about this person? The, Give me uh, one name. Stefan Labossier, my mentor, he's the person who, um, when, when, when I got fired from my second job in 2019, I had nowhere to go. He hired me to be his videographer. Which mm -hmm. I went on tour with him. Um, he's the person who told me to 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 open my Patreon account, which allowed me to be full time. He's a person who's always been there from the very beginning. He's a person where our first viral video. Um, he's honestly, I deleted my YouTube channel in 2018 because we weren't getting a lot of views, and I was embarrassed. And he was the one who forced me to open a YouTube channel and post his video on it. It's our like fourth um, highest viewed video on this channel. So Stefan Labossier is an absolute beast. He's a great man, and and I'm blessed by so many great men. I can go on for days. Gary V. Um, there's just so many people who are amazing human beings. Jose Zuniga, um, Aaron Marino, um, Alice Costa. I can just go for days, man. Jo Joseph Hines, my business partner. Man, there's so many amazing guys, but Stefan Labossier, man, that's my mentor. Stefan Labossier. He's a beast. When we, when we come back to Miami, I would love you. Okay. Would, you would love him. He's um, a rock star. Last name on the list. Yeah. Um, and uh, I want you to be real here. Okay. And I want you to uh, pretend that this you were not in this room and I was asking somebody else. Yeah. And they said this name, and I want the lessons learned from this man that yeah. they want this man to be known for. Yeah. But you, yeah. Hafiz. Yeah. Baoku. 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 <laughs> um, lessons learned from Hafiz. At the end of the day, Hafiz is not perfect. You get a thousand videos from Hafiz, you find a lot of things that are wrong. Hafiz is emotional at times. Hafiz might say the wrong things at times. Hafiz might do too much at times. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. when human humanity is done and recorded, when they're when they when they're quantifying who cared the most, who absolutely from the bottom of their heart cared the most about the well-being of every single person on this planet, especially all the young men who are lost, who are hurting, that need a direction. They will be, without a shadow of a doubt, they'll say a lot of things, but the, they will never for a second say Hafiz did not care. So a person who desperately, radically cared about the well-being of his families, his friends, and the men in today's world. That's awesome, bro. Here's what I'll say about you. 
There's a lot of people that, you know, they're go-getters. Yeah. I'm going to go get, I'm going to go get this. I'm going to go get this. But in addition to that, the next level to that is someone who's a go-giver. Yeah. And that's how I would define you, bro. Thank you. And I didn't know that about you before this interview. I knew some stuff about you. Yeah. So respect to you on Thank that. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, this, is, this is the tail end of this. Um, so I'll give you the final words yeah. before I wrap up. Where should people find you? What should yeah. they know about you? What you're working on? You know, give, give them the little clincher. Yeah. So to me, April 4th, we're launching the, the next. Is that my camera? Cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> April 4th, we're launching the um, our latest collection of the standard suits. We're launching our black suits as well as our black tuxedo. You're also able to, to buy the gray and the navies. Um, so go ahead and go to theaffluentstandard.com and join the waiting list if you'd like to purchase a suit as well as get access to the community. I'm going to let you know the waiting list has about 1,000 people on it, only selling 300 suits. But to me, my desire is all the men are decisive, all the men who are serious, all the men who are committed to excellence, I will guarantee they'll find a way into the community. So if that's you and you're that guy, go to theaffluentstandard.com, sign up for the waiting list, join the standard April 4th. I'd love to connect with you, not just online, but I'd love to meet you in person. That's awesome, bro. Um, here's what I will say we're wrapping up the sauce cast right now valuetainment uh, I pride myself on literally bringing value and tainment and that's I why it. I think um, our audiences keeps coming back you know for a while I focused on just saving that money yeah. and getting wealthy but for me much like you I believe in the trifecta yeah. health wealth and happiness I love it so I've evolved the show to basically focus not just on money and getting wealthy and saving that money but also the other things in life that leads to health, wealth, and happiness. Relationships, whether that's with friends and homies or with women and marriage and, and working on that and getting better, whether that's physically, mentally, spiritually. Um, but it starts, like you said, with radical accountability and self-improvement. So anyway, Hafiz, respect to Thank you. you so I'm much, a fan. Brother. Subscribe to his channel, The Roommates, if you have not. Subscribe to Valuetainment if you Please have not. Do. Subscribe to Valuetainment Money yes. if you have not. Yes. And as always, save that money. We'll see you next time. Love it. Take care, fellas. Sweet. Awesome. <laughs> the, it's always the headphones on.